my thesis for this next lecture is to basically discuss how there's a bunch of iconography or symbols that seem to be used and reused over and over again and the concept of schema and correction comes into play. And I want to also discuss a little bit how these uh, schemas or these icons change as they're being reused. So we're going to look at this Italian Gothic piece by Nicola Pisano, and we've already discussed it before in some other lectures. But let's uh, just talk about it a little bit and discuss some terms first. The, um, the first thing that you need to know about it is that this thing is an Italian Gothic piece. And it basically means that it's not proto-Renaissance and it's not really Renaissance yet, but in some ways I think it really looks almost like it's a Renaissance work. Meaning if you look at the figures themselves, they're all in sort of wet drapery. They're reclining in, a, in what looks like almost some of the figures from the Parthenon that we've looked at. <clears throat> and um, the naturalism and the proportions of the figures almost look like they are sort of seeing something that would be made more in the 1400s than in the 1200s. The iconography of this is very close to a lot of Romanesque and Gothic iconography. And we're going to see this a lot in manuscripts and things like that. So in earlier sections, we've seen some annunciations and we've also seen some crash or nativity scenes and things like that. And those are all put together here in what's called a continuous narrative. So if you look in the upper left hand corner, you see the most important scene for us right now is actually um, the angel. Uh, Gabriel coming and announcing to Mary that she's going to have Jesus uh, as her as her son, the son of God. And she is sort of recoiling a little bit. She has this a little bit of a gesture going on. And then you see in the upper right hand corner of the image, it's a nativity scene with the three wise men. Some of them are missing their heads and things like that. But you see the the crib with the infant Jesus in it. Then in the center, you see this figure of reclining Mary that's larger than all the other figures. And she's in the, pretty much the center of the picture. Then in the lower left hand corner, you see Joseph. He's sort of on the outskirts of the of the composition. and. Uh, next to Joseph, almost in the center bottom of the scene is a baptism scene of Jesus getting, um, basically having his first bath. He's not really being bathed. And in the lower right hand corner, we see um, a series of um, things that relate to Jesus's role as the good shepherd. So all of the scenes are put together and this is called a continuous narrative where you have one picture plane and all of the imagery is there at the same time, it's continuous and it tells the whole story. Now, another term that's going to come up later is something called a typology or typological exegesis, which basically means a typology is when you have an event, usually in the Old Testament, that prefigures Jesus's role. So, for instance, sometimes when you see images of David, that's considered a typology because it prefigures the coming of, of Jesus as the good shepherd like King David was. We're going to see a scene in which Mary... Um, <clears throat> there's a typology concerning Mary at the end of this lecture. So in this next uh, image we're looking at, this is a triptych by Simone Martini. And if you look at the, uh, the panels, you'll see that Martini basically painted the center panel and his, uh, I think it was his father-in-law, Lippo Memi, painted the wings, which are the two figures on either side. So Let's start first by discussing panel painting a little bit and uh, how panel painting works in terms of the three terms you see below. Usually in um, Renaissance churches and in medieval churches, for instance, Romanesque and Gothic churches, they might have a screen or a panel. Sometimes they would have paintings that were individual devotional pieces that were in people's homes. That was a lot rarer. This is probably made for a church and it would made up, be made up of multiple panels. And Poly means many, tick means panel or, or mark. So in this instance, we have a polyptych, which means many panels put together. And it's not a diptych because dip or die means two. And this is actually a triptych because it has three panels. One of the other things that uh, can be a little confusing is the frame on this thing is actually a 19th century frame. We don't know who made it, but it looks Gothic. So that's some of the components that you need to know about this thing is that actually it's not really a, um, it's a sort of polyglot of different times and periods. But we're going to be focusing a little bit on the central panel that shows the Annunciation scene. So we're zooming in on this panel. 
And you can see that it's very similar to Nicola Pisano's uh, iconography of Gabriel coming and announcing to Mary that she's going to have uh, God's child, Jesus. And what you see in this panel is that actually um, Gabriel is lower than Mary. Uh, we have him in the left-hand side. Um, he is offering an olive branch, which is a symbol of peace. He also has a sort of crown of olives, which is a, a wreath on his head, which basically is a symbol of, of peace as well. Between Mary and, and Gabriel is a vessel, which is a symbol of her, that she is the vessel of God. And you have these white flowers, which represent purity, in which she is... Um, her womb is going to be the vessel of God, and out of it come these white flowers, these calla lilies, which are a symbol of purity. And again, just like in Pisano's piece, we see her recoiling slightly from, from the announcement. And coming out of his mouth, basically, I think it's in Italian, uh, it might be in Latin, is basically the Annunciation, basically saying, you're going to have God's baby. In her, she's seated on a throne. And she actually has her head covered, which is a symbol of piety. And um, it's, it's kind of similar to the, uh, the Islamic hijab that we see today being worn. And in her hand is, is actually a Bible, because Mary would be a pious person who was reading the Bible. I think that in the Renaissance period, they would have actually, it, they would have thought it was a book of hours or something like that. But um, Mary is basically Jewish, and they would have known this, and, and that she would have been reading the Old Testament and, and basically been a nice Jewish girl. If we look above um, Mary and Gabriel in the center bay of that sort of tripartite, meaning a three-part division, you see this image in which there is a um, a dove floating between these sort of seraphim. And we've seen these seraphs before when we looked, for instance, at Giotto's painting and Bonaventura Berlingeri when um, St. Francis was receiving the stigmata. And in this center, we see actually the Holy Spirit, which is the dove, and we see surrounding, let me zoom in on this for you. We see surrounding the Holy Spirit is actually the... Um, the seraphim, which are sort of conducting the Holy Spirit down to Mary. If we come down a little bit and look at some of the details of uh, Gabriel and, and uh, Mary, some of the other things that are important iconography, for instance, um, in Florence and in northern Italy, there was a cloth trade and it basically a wool trade and a lot of textiles. And I think that the actually that sort of check pattern or tartan pattern that we see on Gabriel's outfit is actually a representation of the uh, it's sort of like product placement where you see sometimes they put uh, cans of Coke or Nike sneakers in television shows. And it's a way of saying this is uh, relates back to northern Italy and the and the cloth trade. She's also wearing a royal blue, which would be a very expensive color and would be a representation of her basically being a, a royalty and related somewhat to uh, uh, God. So there's an iconography concerning color as well. So overall, what we have here is an image that relates back to earlier representations of Annunciation scenes. Now, I want to show you some more because we're going to see many of these kinds of things. Now, a lot of these polyptics, these many panel pieces, were cut up and divided and uh, separated from other things. This is part of a larger altar piece, and actually I think it's still in place, and we're going to take a look at the larger altar in a minute. But it's the bottom panel that would have run along the base of the altar, which is called a predella, and you can see that up there. The altar was called the Maesta altar, which means the majesty altar. And uh, it's done by an artist, we call him Duccio. Um, you might see on the plaques, Duccio Buonansegna. And it's another Annunciation scene. And it has the same standard iconography that we saw just before. We have Gabriel coming in, and he's got a halo, and he's carrying this staff. And he is uh, sort of making this sign that it looks like a peace sign or a gang sign. And Mary is uh, regarding him and recoiling slightly. In her hand, again, is a Bible. And between them, we see again um, a vessel with white flowers coming out of it, which are, is a symbol of Mary being the vessel of God. And then in the upper part of the, the panel, we can actually see this sort of laser beam coming down from, from the heavens. We can zoom in on that for you. 
And what you can see is actually it's like this little circle with a dove, a white sort of um, creature inside this round circle form, and it's being transmitted down to Mary. The other thing that I want you to notice is that <clears throat> One of the things that Duccio is doing is he's actually even putting this in an architectural setting. So he's making a reference to visual illusionism. And an interesting component about this is the column that is between Gabriel and Mary and also in front of Gabriel kind of gives us a sense that we're on one side and that they're on the inside. So there's this creation of space, which is uh, this increase in illusionism that um, we were talking about with Giotto. Remember that the, um, the lamentation where we had those figures backs to us, that's kind of significant because it shows us that we're outside and they're inside or we're looking over the shoulder of things. So they're actually intercepting the foreground with uh, another shape so that we understand that this is actually an architectural form. And again, this is intuitive perspective when we get some space. So it's sharing a lot of the same iconography, a lot of the same symbolism that we see before. Now, this is a, a slightly uh, different kind of piece because we we actually have, it's not the center panel, it's actually part of almost a comic book strip of panels. And we'll look at this a little bit more in depth. So again, we've got a shared iconography, even including the royal blues that are being used to show Mary being royal and also the royal red. So if we compare the two pieces, we can see that it's almost like a competition between special effects uh, and iconography. We, in Martini's piece, that there's much more of an emphasis on the iconography. It's diagrammatic. It's more symbolic. It's not really meant to be as illusionistic as Duccio. Duccio actually even has a little bit of chiaroscuro, where we can actually trace a light source from the upper left-hand corner, breaking across the figures, and the drapery is painted a little bit more convincingly. Uh, Duccio is also more interested in illusionism because we have the architectural setting. It actually shows the light hitting planes on that architecture. For instance, the sort of triumphal arch that Mary is standing in, um, the front of it that's facing Gabriel actually has a light source on it, which might even be a representation of the light coming down from heaven. The one thing that uh, Duccio does not include is writing. And I think that the, um, not that there was necessarily an enormous rise in literacy during the Renaissance, but there was in the upper classes who were educated. And I think that uh, Martini is kind of making a reference to that. Now, where would we be without talking about Giotto and comparing Giotto against Duccio? And I think that in a way, they were competitors. They were working at the same time period. They were, uh, they were both working with visual illusionism and working with the same kind of iconography. <clears throat> I don't know if they actually came in uh, direct competition with each other. But again, the image that you see on the left-hand side is part of the Maesta altar, and it's a, it's a panel, a, a single sequence from the Maesta altar that kind of shows um, Christ entering Jerusalem. And we looked at this in the sarcophagus of Junius Bassus earlier. And we also, if you, uh, there's some stained glass windows that share the same schema. So this is a standard schema of, uh, it's Palm Sunday and Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And we have kids always in the trees who are playing. And we have, um, uh, the apostles following behind Jesus. So, and usually the city is represented behind. Now, a couple of things that I think are kind of, uh, important to discuss about Renaissance painting is even though this is kind of a toga party and everybody's wearing togas and, and gowns that look like they are from the, um, the first century um, when Jesus was around, the cities themselves actually look like Florentine cities and have Roman sorts of arches and architecture. And it actually looks like architecture that came, that came between the first century and the 1300s. So what they're kind of doing is giving you these anachronistic, and anachronistic means out of time elements, uh, that make you relate to it a little bit more because you could actually imagine Jesus was coming to town. Now, if we compare the two pieces, we discussed uh, Giotto's piece in an earlier lecture. Giotto's is extremely illusionistic, and there are some things that he does that are a little bit stronger in terms of the illusionism than Duccio does.
for instance, if you look at how Giotto has layered the apostles who are coming up behind him in his fresco, we can actually see it kind of makes more sense because the figures are overlapping each other and they're actually obscuring or obfuscating the people behind each other. So the overlapping is hiding people behind uh, the, the ones in the foreground. So there's a foreground, middle ground, background kind of relationship. In Duccio, he's not really choosing to do that in quite the same level. It almost looks like they are standing on some kind of steps or some kind of platform behind the, the apostles in the foreground. So he's attempting in Duccio's piece to show all of the pieces and all of the apostles and all of the people. The architecture and the size scale relationship in Giotto's makes a lot more sense too if you think about it because the figures are in the foreground and then as you move back the figures become a little bit smaller and the architecture makes sense. Duccio doesn't do that as convincingly. If you look at Duccio's piece it actually is um, less illusionistic. He doesn't understand intuitive perspective as much and you have these figures in the foreground who are the same size as figures in the background and even the architecture doesn't really flow back in quite the same way. You have this vertical perspective but then it starts to look down when you look into those arches. If we pull back a little bit, Duccio is also kind of showing you that there is a gateway to the city or a wall around the city in which um, they're walking on the road that's inside the gateway between the two walls and it's not convincingly painted. It's kind of bizarre looking and it almost feels like you're in a helicopter floating above the scene or an aerial view, whereas in Giotto, he overlaps it a little bit more. So if I was going to hire a painter, I'd probably hire Giotto because for me, his special effects are a little bit better. And so Duccio is being a little bit more literal, a little bit more diagrammatic in how he tells his story. And he just wants to make sure that you see all of the elements that that um, sort of pertain to Christ entering Jerusalem. What you see here is actually the front and the back of that altar that we were discussing, the, the so-called Maesta altar. And you can see that... Uh, in the bottom image on the screen, it's it's referred to as verso, which just means the back. And it has all of those scenes that we've been talking about. And you can look a little bit closer in the lower left-hand corner, you can see Duccio's Christ entering Jerusalem. That does not include the predella that we discussed because the predella would be a panel that would actually run where the captions are running underneath both of these pictures. Now, what I'd like to do is actually kind of zoom in a little bit on the top image and look at the Madonna and angels with saints. Now, if you look at <clears throat> Duccio's piece, you can see that it's almost like it's a cross between Giotto and Cimabue's work, uh, where we have this figure of Jesus that looks actually anatomically almost correct. I mean, that's a pretty enormous baby. The drapery is very realistic and, and looks actually kind of um, like Giotto's drapery in his um, virgin and child uh, panel. But the faces look a little bit more like Duccio's do. They're a little bit more in the Byzantine uh, style. The Byzantine style, to refresh your memory, is basically uh, the way that the anatomy of the faces would be that the eyes are a little too far up in the forehead, the nose is elongated, and the mouth is a little too far down in the chin. Where Giotto gets the proportions of the face a little bit more correctly, uh, Duccio is very similar to Cimabue in the faces that are a little bit more stylized in that Maniera Greca or Greek manner or Byzantine style. The other thing that um, Duccio does, which is uh, more similar to um, Cimabue, is that we can see that there's an overlapping of these apostles and saints that are flanking the, the throne of wisdom that Mary is seated on. And, uh, and we have, um, it's not an illusionistic uh, kind of uh, space that they're on. It's almost like they're on bleachers or some kind of stands in a way. And the other thing that I think is closer to Chimabue is that the not all the figures are regarding Mary. Only a couple are regarding Mary or looking at her. So the humanistic gesture is downplayed a bit, whereas in, in Giotto's, you can actually see in his uh, Madonna enthroned, there's actually a reference to Mary. All of the figures are looking and the overlapping is a little bit more realistic. So Duccio is kind of this guy who doesn't quite take the leap that Giotto does, even though he's working at the same time period. Now, 
if you ever get to Siena, you would be able to take a look at this panel. And I think in some ways that it kind of relates an awful lot to Giotto's Arena Chapel, where we see a series of scenes and pictures that are set up like a comic book, and they tell the story of the life and times of Jesus. And uh, in the center of it is the sacrifice that that he made uh, to save um, Christian and Catholic souls. And we have each one of the episodes of his story. In the lower left-hand corner, right next Next to Christ entering Jerusalem, there's a little scene of um, the Last Supper, and we see the backs of the figures are to uh, to the audience, and that's significant because it's very similar to what um, Giotto was doing in his lamentation as well. So I think that these guys were sort of copying each other, were sort of plagiarizing each other. They wouldn't have seen it that way. They would have seen it as you know it's just a continuing tradition in which they borrow icons and symbols from each other. wanted to end the lecture by talking about this idea of the typology that we discussed earlier. And uh, just to refresh your memory, a typology or typological exegesis usually is when you have an Old Testament story, for instance, the story of, of David as a prefiguration of the coming of Jesus, and that David is sort of like an Old Testament version of, of uh, what Christ did when he got here. In this instance, if you look at the title, it's the birth of the Virgin. It's not the birth of Jesus, but you can see that um, it's sort of a correction on the original schema, where if it's the birth of, of uh, Mary, who is Jesus' uh, mother, Mary is being born, and the same kinds of uh, applications sort of apply. You have Mary's father in the left-hand panel. You have uh, um Anna or Anne, um, St. Anne in the, in the center of the picture reclining in the same way that we looked at when we were looking, for instance, at, um, at uh, Pisano's piece. Um, and then in the right-hand side where the wise men would have been, you actually have these sort of maids bringing in these garments. And it almost looks like they're carrying a traditional prayer shawl that Jews would have carried called a talus. And um, they're carrying in a vessel, but the vessel doesn't have um, uh, white flowers coming out of it. And the architecture that's surrounding these figures looks an awful lot like a Gothic cathedral that has a uh, ribbed groin vaults, it has pointed arches, and in the same way that we looked at some of the earlier things by Duccio, you have these panels in this triptych that are intercepting the scene and make you feel like you're standing outside the architectural structure and looking in. There's a lot of intuitive perspective, especially in the tiles on the floor where they seem to recede back in space. And then that um, that garment or that, uh, that textile that Mary is on Mary's bed, we see this textile actually recedes back in what almost looks like one point perspective, but if you were to trace the points out, none of this stuff really makes sense. In the left-hand panel, you see uh, through the doorway into some deep space in the background. It looks like a Gothic cathedral behind it. So they're actually making a reference to um, an earlier period of Gothic architecture and that Mary is being born uh, to Anne. And um, it follows the same sort of schema. But in this instance, this is not a story that would have been told uh, in the Bible, in any version of the Bible, the Old or the New Testament. And so when we see stories that are sort of add-ons or uh, prequels, kind of like when you watch a movie and they do a prequel to the movie uh, that, that isn't in the original text, we usually refer to this as apocryphal. Um, there are books in the Bible that are called the Apocrypha, not Apocalypse, which is different. The Apocrypha are a series of books that are sometimes included in some uh, versions of the Bible that usually fall between the Old and the New Testament, usually in the, um, in the Jewish Bibles, and they contain, for instance, the story of Judith and Holofernes. What we have here is, uh, is a scene that is not actually told in any of the religious texts and in any of the primary texts, for instance, the Old or New Testament of the Bible. And so when we see a scene that's sort of like an add-on that, that, that um, they would have believed and told, it's called an apocryphal story, which means outside of the text. Sometimes in today's vocabulary, apocrypha literally means something that isn't true or sort of made up.